the awesome music continues, and it is so good to be with you, to be at home, to be with friends and family, but to be in the place Amanda and I think of as our spiritual home. Um, I wish that Amanda could be with us today. Uh, she was here last week for Sierra's baptism. She's actually singing today in Pensacola, but sitting with Sierra, I still feel like Amanda's with me right there, uh, like her mini-me, sort of. Um, first, uh, let me say on behalf of my dear friend and campus minister, John Tadlock, keep Tad and Lacey in your prayers. Uh, been a part of the health going, ongoing health conversation with Tad. He and Lacey have been to Pensacola to visit with us, and uh, I uh, was hoping he could travel. I was looking forward to being with you at a later time. I'm so honored to pinch hit. But Tad says, please tell them while you're there that my time at Williams was most formative to my ministry. I've always felt a deep sense of pride in their courage that kept them true to their commitment to following Christ. My prayer for them is that in this new season, they will continue with the sacred peace that has always characterized their journey. In this new season of, of, of my life that I'm still adjusting to, I'm, I'm really focused on stories, and many of the stories that are important in my life were birthed right here. For those who came after my tenure, you may not know that we were here where I served as pastor from 87 through uh, 95. But my history with, with this place and these people goes back to childhood. I grew up with the misunderstanding, thinking that Doyle and Danola Green were my aunt and uncle. <laughs> Danola's brother married my father's sister, and I would come to their house and play as a child. Tim and I are the same age, and I remember back in the day when the fun-loving teenager Sharonda was dating the suspicious German boy. <laughs> <clears throat> And then, not long thereafter, we began making trips to Doc Boozer, and he came to our family farm many times to help pull a calf, and then when I was called to ministry, they were kind enough to invite me to preach here. And then when I started to Jacksonville State, uh, Dr. Reuben Boozer was assigned to be my advisor. He had been my father's principal in high school, and uh, then I was in Mrs. Norton's English class with Carol Ligon just before she married Amanda's cousin Wendell. <laughs> and so when I came here in 1987, it felt a little like Baptist incest. <laughs> um, so stories really do make up the fabric of our lives. They're part of the, the tapestry, especially the grace stories. And when grace is introduced into our biography, every story it doesn't have to be in church. When grace is introduced into our biography, every story becomes a grace story. So today we stand on tall shoulders, every one of us who are the living pastors and interim pastors, standing on the tall shoulders of people like Floyd McLeod, Bob's dad, who served so capably, and then Lamar Dinkins, and John Tadlock, who holds the record for being the longest interim pastor in the country. And then the dear interim Herman Cobb, who became so interwoven into the life of this church. And then my privilege to be the first full-time pastor, followed by our dear friend Mike Oliver, with two wonderful interims in the interlude with Dr. Ralph Langley, who would tell us stories about his amazing grace, now both with the Lord in eternity, and then Gary Britton, Bob's successor. And then Chris Thomas, who is one of the finest pastors in all the U.S. And I have one of his professors in my dinner group, and she's always bragging on what a good student Chris was and what a great pastor he's turned out to be. And then to be with my mentor, Bob Ford. Tad was my campus minister through um, my freshman year. Bob came between my freshman and sophomore year. Bob has been the designated pinch hitter here 
for a number of years. And my goal in our time together this morning is to be very respectful of our time. Many pastors have waxed eloquent. I want to wax nostalgic for just a few moments. And though the sermon may not be as scholarly as one Chris would bring, or as rich and thorough as one Mike Oliver would bring, and it certainly won't be as brief as one Bob Ford would bring. <laughs> if you blink when Bob's preaching, it's over. One of my two nephews here said, we love Brother Bob. He gets to the point and gets you out of there. So the scripture from Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 and 9, uh, 18 through 22, very quickly, we know some of these words, but listen to them with fresh dynamic. For it is by grace you were saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork. One translation says, we are God's workmanship. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Consequently, beginning in verse 19, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. It says in the King James, aliens. Think E.T., phone home. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple to the Lord. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling. You are being, not have been, you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. This scripture was chosen with great intentionality. And so I, I would love to share a little background on the scripture and share out of this volume of Oshkosh stories that I'm compiling, at least three that I want you to bookmark and think about and underscore, and then we'll have that great dinner together. Ephesus, I didn't really get till I went there. I, I've read the commentaries, but the first time I walked the streets of, of Ephesus and took another group last year, the first time that I went there, it, it came on like a light. It's one of the most historic cities in the world. The library there represented extraordinary intelligence and rivaled the library at Alexandria as one of the greatest libraries in the ancient world. And so it had the greatest sculptures, it had the greatest artisans, and in addition to, if you've seen the ruins or read about the ruins at Pompeii, it had some of the most advanced technology. It had running water, and it had heating running water in an era when Paul was there running through clay conduits into what's called the modern houses built on the hill. It was even rumored, though not substantiated, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, went to Ephesus, where she was taken refuge after Jesus ascended back into heaven. It's a fascinating place, a support city. And back when Paul was there, the water came all the way up to the edge of town. Now it's five miles out to the ocean. The field is full of silt and it's very fertile soil. But when Paul stood and looked over Ephesus, these words must have come to him. For it is by grace you are saved, not of your works, not of your artistry, not of your vast knowledge from the great library, not as though you're a sculptor that can sculpt your own lives but you're saved by grace through faith. But when you see these sculptures, when you see the greatest artisans, when you see the architecture that's been built, the one thing greater than that is you because you are God's workmanship. His artistry in you is greater than the greatest artistry known to humankind. But for that artistry to really take root, you have to remember that Jesus Christ has to be the cornerstone of your life. And if He's the cornerstone, what God is building in you, what God is nurturing in you, what God is cultivating in you, will become something bigger and better than your mind can possibly comprehend. And it is not yet a finished work. It is not yet a finished work. It is ongoing. And as I look back over the history of this place, I can say, you are God's handiwork. You're a testimony to God's workmanship. 
But what God is building isn't nearly complete. You can burn the note on a campus, but the construction's ongoing in the human lives represented in this room. All the stories that Paul told and the stories that you've lived and the stories we could tell about each other and the stories that would encourage some of us, the stories that would embarrass some of us. But there are three. Oh, there's a story about Ralph. Ralph and Dolores, a picture of faithfulness. Amanda and I have an entire wall of cabinets with Amanda's photo albums. Amanda's taken probably five or 6,000 of the photos. We have a couple of dozen others who have given us. The other two to 3,000 came from Dolores. <laughs> and I still have in my desk the album she prepared in 1995 when we left to go to Kentucky. And then there's Ralph, the epitome of faithfulness, who after retiring as a chemist with the pipe shop came to be uh, the custodian and so many witticisms of Ralph. But one morning... One morning, you just can't make this stuff up. <laughs> One morning, I was getting out of my car. I had been here early at 5.30 to walk the track with Doris just before Pascal and Lamar arrived. And just as the first wave was coming for coffee to sit on the old church pew at E.L.'s store, I could hear the jibber-jabber cranking up. And I, I had gone home, changed clothes, put on my come to the office clothes and was getting out of the car and I could hear Ralph Struck. Isn't it amazing? You learn the tone and pattern of people's voices but if you're here long enough you learn what their truck sounds like <laughs> and I knew Hubert's truck and I knew Ralph's truck. So I heard Ralph's truck but when I looked I took a double take for here coming from behind E.L. store was that brown and beige truck that Ralph drove till it fell apart coming down the road in reverse in the oncoming lane. And he stopped at the stop sign and he looked and waved at the, the guys at EL's who were discussing the almanac and when to plant tomatoes. And then in reverse, he drove all the way into the parking lot and pulled into his parking and he got out and I'm, Ralph, wh what are you doing? And he said, well, my transmission's going out. The only gear that works is reverse. <laughs> and I've never missed work, so I came to church driving in reverse. <laughs> Ralph Green is the only person I've ever seen to go forward by going backward. <laughs> but I've seen a lot of churches try to do it through the years. And a church cannot go forward by going backwards. You cannot move to where God wants you to be by being preoccupied with the rearview mirror of where you've been. And Ralph can do it, but we can't. I've tried. The danger of retirement, by the way, is that you look back with such nostalgia that you think the best years are already behind you. And you hear a still small voice saying the best years are still ahead of you. And sometimes as a congregation, we need to hear someone say, the years behind you were great years but the best years are still ahead of you. And I believe if we are good stewards of our nostalgia, if we are good stewards of our imagination, our nostalgia can inspire us to move into the future with creative and innovative energy like we've never known before. And then there was the day. <laughs> you just can't make this up. There was the day that Ralph came in and said, there is a swarm of bees on the oak tree between the office and the school building. This was before the new fellowship hall had been built. And I went out and sure enough, here was this huge swarm of bees. Ralph said, well, what do we do? I don't want to get them now. I said, wait for Perry Green to get off work. And I called Perry and sure enough, within 15 minutes, here he came in his beekeeper suit with a stick. And he went through the bee, got the queen bee, and he's walking. I wish I'd had a video. We didn't have cell phones back then. We had a video of Perry walking in the bee suit across the, the lawn of the church back to his truck to the bee box to put the entire hive of bees surrounding the queen there. Well, it, it wasn't but a few months later that we had to tear down the old William School, a part of our wonderful history. 
in a day when many of us took pictures and cried. And after we had the, 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 the ceremony to vote on the new building and the school was coming down, we invited people to get any wood and stuff off the building. And somebody went over to the first classroom in the front where we used to have the New Orleans-style dinner to raise money for the youth musical. And they took off the first board and they brought it in and said, look at this, it had sticky stuff all over it. And I went out we pulled the boards back. And I looked inside the wall and it was honeycomb. And we pulled off more of the wall and the entire wall, floor to ceiling, was a honeycomb. And the bees that had been on the tree had been in the wall of the school building. And when we started tearing the school building down, There is a symbol of our past, our present, and our future was a honeycomb. And all of a sudden, some of you in this room, much like you brought your hammers to get the wood or the piece of the floor or part of your old locker or one of the desks, ran home to get your mason jars. (laughs) And Perry came over and took this wooden scoop, and the bees were gone and was scooping honey. And I have no idea how many pints and quarts of honey were taken out of the wall. And someone said to me, isn't it, and they meant this, a sweet moment to look back on the past and move in the future and have this as a symbol. And I remembered and said something about Proverbs 16, 24 that said, pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and they bring healing to the bones. And that describes the spirit of William's. That in a world gone toxic with their dialogue and their conversation, that this is a place characterized by the honeycomb that recognizes we not only want to be intelligent, thinking, sensible human beings, deeply grounded in our spiritual faith, but we want to be a place of healing, a place of wholeness, a place of grace. And then the story I wish had never happened. And and like some of you, in the movie, the the musical, the book, the musical now on Alexander Hamilton, we were in the room where it happened. So my tenure here got off to a tragic start. Uh, And and a, a serious tragedy and then, oh gosh, I wish I could forget. But my first week as pastor, our nursery director, who had been my high school classmate, again, the Baptist incest here, says, um, George was in high school just ahead of me. His dad and my dad played baseball together. George's mom gave me my first leadership position. When I was in the third grade and she was my bus driver, she let me be the flagger to run the railroad track and look both ways and wave the bus over. And then George graduated high school and went to work, if I remember, for Saxon's Candy Kitchen and was the cook. And when it became the restaurant, I would go in and George would cook my dinner. And then George was a member at Post Oak, my first church in Amanda's home church. And then when George came here and we moved across the road, Miss May said to me, you got one job and if you can do it, You'll be my pastor forever. And I said, Miss May, what's that? I thought she wanted me to pray with her. I thought she she said, if you can get George McCurley to come to church. (laughs) And so I've told George a story. So uh, uh, Marilyn and Joan were playing the instruments. Linda Reed had come to pinch hit while Joan had surgery. And I remember George being an excellent musician in school and having played. I said, George, you come play. So George came to to pinch hit, and he's still here, 30 <laughs> years later. <laughs> so, uh, and what a great neighbor and friend. Well, my high school classmate raised in my home church was Sharon Fondren, who married Dwight Slatt and lived across the road from the church. And some of you remember the tragedy. Sharon was on the way to work at Kmart the week I started it, and my phone rang, and it was Jimmy Green calling, saying, can you come out? We were still living in Weaver the Sunday before my first... The, the, week before my first sermon, and Sharon had been killed in a wreck. And so my first week here, I did a funeral for one of my high school classmates and friends, and it's still tough to think about. 
And then a few weeks went by, you all welcomed me with open arms. It, it was wonderful. It was, I, I was intimidated. My, my, my advisor from college was chair of deacons. I knew that Dean Norton was grading my grammar every Sunday <laughs> that I got up to preach. Rodney Friary stayed awake the whole service, and he was my sociology professor and dear friend, advised me through some independent study. It was, you couldn't have been better. But it came to my first communion, first time. So Reuben said, we do communion at night, and a lot of people come. The church was almost this full. And he said, so they put a cloth over the communion table. And by the way, here, uh, you may not know this, and, and I'm retired, nobody can... We, we had the best communion bread in the world. This is the only church where people came and asked for seconds on communion <laughs> bread because Aunt Johnny made the pie crust with communion. But you didn't know that we were the first church to use real wine for communion. And it still had the Welch's label on it, but Aunt Johnny would buy it a year in advance, and she would not put it in the refrigerator. It was put in the cabinet of the old kitchen. And I went before that first communion and held up the bottle. You could see the vitamins swimming around in the communion. So they prepared the table, and, and the table is covered, and Reuben said, the deacon chair and the pastor will stand and, and fold the cloth and put it down and then serve communion. Well, I'd done it several times before. Uh, I'd been a pastor for four years before coming here. So I wasn't bothered by that. So it came that sacred moment. Reuben was on that side. I was on this side. Hope I can get through this. <laughs> and so we lifted the cloth. And as we're lifting it, I felt some tension. And in a normal church, you have an undercloth, that's a tablecloth, and a cover cloth that you lift, fold, and put aside. So I'm lifting, and Reuben is doing this, like you're not lifting hard enough. So I pulled a little harder. And he's doing this, like you're not lifting hard enough. And everyone's quiet. And finally I thought, this cloth is coming off. And so I pulled the cloth off. And when I did, I pulled all the elements <laughs> of the communion out in the floor on my first communion. And there's this circle of juice on the old green carpet. And Chris, the reason they chose this color <laughs> and the reason I wore this tie this is my grape tie. They call this wisteria. This is Welch's carpet. <laughs> and, and so I, I stepped over, and I looked at the, and, and Roy Barker was on the front row, and, and Roy was about to burst. He was quivering <laughs> with laughter. And I just said, go ahead and laugh. And before Roy could explode, Mrs. Berkheimer was the first one to just erupt. And we had this huge moment of laughter and rather than being embarrassed, I stepped out front, and probably the only time I've received such a gift for words in a moment, I said, there are a lot of worse ways to destroy the communion of a church. And spilled elements can be cleaned up. Let's try again next Sunday night. Next Sunday evening, we increased attendance by 20%. <laughs> and they did not put a cloth over the table. And Chris, they did not put a cloth over the table for the rest of my tenure here. But all around the world, churches are getting fragmented and their sense of community is going haywire. And this church has been an example of what it means to put community back together after a blizzard of 93, after a Palm Sunday tornado of 94, after Hurricane Opal of 95, after the twin storm of 2011, and even more importantly, the personal storms and rifts that come up between individuals. My word to us as we embrace our future is go forward, not backward. Keep tasting the honeycomb of the wonderful unity of God's fellowship. And on that occasion where you spill, don't look back. Put relationships back together and go forward. For you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And I'm glad to be a part of that tapestry.